dear students, the um, core mission of a school of governance is to enable students to assume responsibility for advancing the common good. The challenge for a school of governance is to anticipate which knowledge and skills will be required in the future to perform such tasks. The students entering the school today will have around four to five decades of service ahead of them. Our task today, as was mentioned, is not to look backwards, but to adopt a radically forward-looking perspective. Now, no social scientist is naive enough to believe that the future of societies can be predicted. What researchers do is study today's world to derive generalizable knowledge that has the highest probability of predicting future developments. Understanding today's world is the best key we can give to our students if we want them to shape tomorrow's world. Understand today, shape tomorrow is the Hertie School's motto and will stay our motto. The double meaning of understand today, shape tomorrow is important. It not only signals learn today and lead tomorrow, it also signals understand the world that is surrounding you so that you can improve it when you will in leading positions in the future. When I started to think about the Hertie School's future, I tried to adopt exactly that logic and would like to share it with you here today. What is it that we need to understand in today's world so that the Hertie School can prepare the best public policy leaders for tomorrow? And how should the Hertie School evolve against the backdrop of change? Ladies and gentlemen, 15 years ago, I was invited to lecture at Humboldt University at a conference about change. I ended my presentation with a remark that every single generation believed it was living a period of dramatic change, but that with hindsight, there was far more continuity than everyone believed. So I basically told the conference they were doing the wrong topic. Since then, I have either become myopic or I have changed my opinion quite radically. Today it is me seeing some very fundamental changes of historic magnitude that the School of Public Policy must take into account. The most important transformation is the role of the nation state. And the resulting reconfiguration of governance structures should be at the heart of how we define public policy schools. If cities were the main reference point for governance uh, over around 2,000 years until the 16th century, the nation state has then replaced them as a key reference point for politics. But today we're witnessing the decline of the nation state and of national sovereignty, and we see the emergence of a complex set of multi-level governance structures. This change has implications for the way governance should be researched and taught, and also for the governance toolkit our students should carry with them when they leave our school. In its pure form, the old world of the nation state was quite simple. There were two main decision modes that students of public policy know. The first mode was the political decision, the world of politics. Decisions mandated by a majoritarian vote, representative or direct, often with some redistributive implications. These decisions were perceived as legitimate thanks to the procedural or direct input legitimacy on which they were based. Usually these decisions opposed political left and political right. The second mode was the expert decision. Choices made in largely technocratic settings aimed at enhancing general welfare. So policy is meant to make everyone better off. The real origin of these decisions was often non-majoritarian, carried out by independent institutions or committees, but perceived as legitimate because they were meant to make everyone better off. A good example is the independent monetary policy, but most regulatory policies also fall into that domain. This expert decision context used to be the dream world for public policy students, and Lisa also alluded to it earlier on. Many countries even entered into a state of expertocracy, where politics was driven by technocrats, often trained at our public policy schools. 
What I would like to submit today is that the, that the incipient decline of the nation state and the emergence of multi-level governance is deeply affecting the traditional politics policy divide. It has become much harder to apply the main tools of the sovereign nation state, law and enforcement, to solve policy challenges arising in supra or transnational contexts. The realms of politics and policies more and more, more, and more often overlap because a measure that is purely welfare enhancing in one country could be totally redistributive in other countries. Think about global climate change. Finally, politics itself no longer seems to care about the old world left-right distributive battles, but fights about the future of the nation state itself. I'll come back to that. Let me briefly outline the two dr main drivers of these changes, globalization and digitalization. Now, you know them as buzzwords, but let me try to describe why these buzzwords are so important for what a governance school does. First, and I know it's late in the afternoon, and I know you've already listened to speeches, but I think there is some conceptual analysis necessary here. First, there is a new fundamental incongruence between the geographical scope of politics and the scope of the policy challenges. So the tasks we need to solve are not aligned with the policy institutions at our disposal. Legitimacy is local or national. Policy challenges are regional or global. If you find this too obvious, I invite you to reflect for a minute whether national governments, national politics, and national political discourse have really incorporated that fundamental difficulty. How do you regulate banks that hold more than 50% of their balance sheets offshore to escape national regulation? Fighting pollution from traffic in China could be a simple national political issue. But today, it is a global policy challenge affecting hotel owners on the Maldives as much as farmers in, Miss in Missouri. Think about migration issues. Migration may be as old as mankind, but one of the key ideas on which the nation state is built is the idea of a controllable national border. In many parts of the world today, I would say in most parts of the world today, we find that territories are more open than some policymakers believing in this old nation state environment would like to accept. Globalization already was very well known and a widely discussed phenomenon when it was put on steroids by digitalization. Technological change is the other big driver of the transformation of our policy environment. Think about, think about developments of just the past decade. Some value creation has become a local, non-local. We can't locate it. Where does the value creation of Airbnb, of Uber, of Spotify take place geographically when the real value creation is an app with basically unlimited scalability, which enhances local value creation through renting houses, cars, or listening to music everywhere in the world? You don't know where to locate this value creation. Digitalization has transformed companies into Teflon-like institutions where no regulation can stick. How do you regulate companies that don't do what they claim they do? Does Airbnb, the biggest hotel provider in the world, own a single hotel? Do Google, Facebook, and Twitter, the world's biggest news websites or services, employ a single journalist? Does Uber, the world's biggest transportation provider, own a single car? Some technology-driven policy, uh, technology policy challenges arise at a pace that makes it literally impossible for policymakers and politicians to react. A Silicon Valley entrepreneur once said to me, none of the big startups got where they are today without reinventing legislation before lawmakers did it. Now, think through that sentence for a second. Startups invented legislation before lawmakers could do that. Ladies and gentlemen, if the main tools of policymaking were legislation and enforcement, 
and both are tied to the nation state, then the changing geographical scope of governance and digitalization deeply, deeply affect policymaking. But they also affect politics itself. Politics in most developed countries has undergone dramatic changes in recent years. In France, in the second round of the 2017 presidential election, there were two candidates that belonged neither to the traditional left nor the traditional right. In Britain, the vote about staying inside the European Union split both the Labour Party and the Tories. In the US, the election of Donald Trump turned the political sphere upside down. In Italy, just a few months ago, two non-traditional parties both positioned against the European Union reached a majority. In Spain, in 2016, two parties, Podemos and Ciudadanos, not on the national stage two years before that election, obtained almost 40% of the votes. The list does not end here. We all feel that this phenomenon of the recomposition of our political system is no longer an isolated occurrence, limit to one or the other nation. It is a trend. What has changed? My favorite answer to this question came from an elderly French woman in the audience of a lecture I gave in Aix-en-Provence about the future of the European Union in 2016. She came to me after my short remarks and said, I like your idealism about Europe and the European Union. I'm also an idealist. I have voted for the left my entire life. But Europe is destroying France. The next election is no longer about the left or the right. It is about whether we want Europe, this globalization, or not. And I will vote against Europe, against globalization. I looked at her and asked whether she planned to vote for Front National or for the far-left anti-European movement of Jean-Luc Mélenchon. She very quietly replied, I don't know yet which is a remarkable answer. This woman clearly felt the traditional opposition of left and right, even at the extremes, no longer provided answers to what she felt were the main questions in today's political world. She effectively recomposed the political spectrum for herself, leaving left and right aside and focusing on a different dimension, Europe, or the nation state. What's interesting is that you will hear very similar statements in other countries. It's not always the European Union that is the enemy, but the uncontrolled powers of globalization or open borders for which the European Union stands as a scapegoat. The new populist votes are about taking back control, about America first, about closing our borders to protect us. These new votes are an expression of unease with the open society, and they fundamentally rearrange the way politics in our developed societies is structured. I believe, and I'm not the only one, we can summarize most of these changes in our political system by simply adding a second axis to the traditional left-right spectrum. The second dimension pits the proponents of the open against the proponents of the closed society. Many of the traditional left and right wing parties are split. They see among their supporters those who generally favor globalization, European integration, and open borders. But they also see those who completely reject these phenomena. If you are not sure, ask Angela Merkel. The second axis of politics has started shaping politics more than the traditional left right divide. It has become dominant. For policymaking, this has a very important implication. Supranational bodies like the EU or the ECB that were long perceived as groupings of experts helping the common good are now political. The WTO used to attract groups of demonstrators. Today, it is attacked by the President of the United States. The open society and its experts are suddenly at the heart of the political debate. Why is that the case? One explanation could be that national political leaders try to keep up the illusion they can still control and steer what is going on in the world. 
but many citizens feel that this control is gone, and they blame national politicians for it. This is as true for Chemnitz as it is true for London. Take back control was the mantra of the Brexiteers. The problem is, and Brexit is a proof of this, no one knows how to take back control. But citizens ask for solutions, not for uncertainty. So there is a real question. How can legitimate political control be exercised in a setting in which the scope of the exercise of political control and the scope of the political challenges are no longer aligned? It seems to me that the world has best understood this question through the financial crisis after 2008, and then in the euro era crisis after 2011. These crises revealed the tensions between global markets and national politics as nothing else before. Many people felt banks were rescued while workers were not. Many people felt gains were individualized while losses were collectivized. Many people lost jobs because of phenomena they didn't fully understand, and they seemed beyond the control of their elected representatives. The rise of the second dimension of politics is the story of the difficulty of the nation state to get at grips with globalization. It is the story of the replacement of the old left versus right opposition, bosses versus workers, with the new open versus closed opposition, bosses and workers benefiting from global exchange versus bosses and workers losing from global exchange. It is also the story about the attempts to create new politically legitimate structures at the supranational level, such as the EU or the G20. It is the story of the difficulty to redistribute and the difficulty to regulate. Ladies and gentlemen, the illustrations I've just given contain three core messages. Number one, the nation state, its administration and political structure run the risk of being totally ill-prepared for the challenges ahead. Second, technological change affects policy making in ways we still haven't fully understood. And third, politics itself is undergoing dramatic change. What does this all imply for the Hertie School? I will first outline some principles and then talk about the strategy ahead. First, and you've sensed this earlier on, my analysis highlights the foresight of my predecessors. Michael Zorn founded the school with the objective to think governance beyond the nation state. Helmut Anheyer liked to reduce the mission of the school to three principles, the three I's, internationality, interdisciplinarity, and intersectorality. These ideas and principle are still valid. We will continue to live them. Second, we rightly label our school a school of governance, not government. We understand that steering public policy for the purpose of the common good in today's context is a task that cannot be reached by government alone, but through an interplay of policy experts, political actors, responsible private decision-taking, independent media, and a third sector, such as foundations and NGOs. When I look at the career trajectories of our around 1,500 alumni by now, they're almost evenly distributed between the public, the private, and the third sectors. They work in the German Chancellery, at Google, or Save the Children. Third, we know that a public policy school always needs to three channels in parallel, teaching, research, and outreach. These three principles are of equal importance in what we do and in the overall composition of the faculty. Teaching, dear students, is closest to our hearts. It's our core mission, and it should always be what makes us special. We want to accompany you as future leaders in your preparation for taking over responsibility. But we also teach current leaders, executives, and perhaps should do so more, in particular here in Berlin. In our teaching, we not only focus on transmitting state-of-the-art knowledge in the core areas such as economics, law, or public policy, we recognize that transferable skills have become more important. Every future public policymaker will need to be able to interpret a complex statistical analysis and understand what an algorithm is. 
at the same time knowing how to lead a team, how to successfully run projects that stretch across all three sectors, our management techniques and skills that can be taught. Finally, our teaching should enable personalities to speak up. We all, not, we all know, especially those coming from um, higher levels of hierarchy in this room, we all know that reporting lines and hierarchy is important. But if the Hertie School only trains obedient experts, then we have failed in our task. Excellent teaching without research is impossible. We are a university. It is the state-of-the-art researcher who understands today's world. Research at the Hertie School should be free and innovative, sometimes crazy and compelling, sometimes boring but compelling. But we would always like to uh, take into account the highest global standards of scholarship. The only desire I would like to express for research at the Hertie School is that it should be relevant. Life is too short for irrelevant research. This gets me to outreach. There's an increasing gap between experts and policy making. There are even increasing gaps among experts. A school of public policy has the obligation to act as a translator to make state-of-the-art research accessible and allow it to be taken into account in political decisions. At the Hertie School, we take this outreach very seriously through our think tanking activities, through state of the art communication, through events and media presence. And now it's time for an important remark. A scholar should never forget there are two worlds. We analyze as researchers, we judge based on norms and opinions. We should analyze and judge, but we should keep these two worlds apart. I see only one exception to this political neutrality obligation. On the second axis of politics that I described before, the axis that opposes the closed and the open society, the Hertie School has a clear moral and normative obligation to speak up. Nationalism and the return to a sealed off nation state is not what we stand for or believe in. What we need is not a world of closed borders and economic nationalism, but a successful approach to governance beyond the nation state. How do these principles I just shared with you translate into shaping the strategy? First, we will further grow our faculty around the core challenges of governance by putting an even stronger emphasis on those who straddle traditional disciplines like economics, law, or political science. We will hire a dozen additional professors, for example, in cross-cutting fields like international political economy, health governance, digital governance, in cybersecurity, uh, to mention just a few. We'll also strengthen the faculty profiles that are more horizontal to the traditional policy fields with uh, positions in areas such as public management and leadership or methods and data analysis. As Frank Martin mentioned, we'll create a data lab to further enhance our expertise in methods, statistics, or algorithms, but also programming and visualization. These are competencies and tools future policymakers will need for sure. Second, and it was mentioned, we will build five centers of competence to create a stronger research, teaching, and outreach profile in fields that we believe characterize the school's mission in a particular way. Each center will bring together a group of faculty members, postdocs, doctoral students working in a specific area. Three of our new centers will focus on these three basic or on three basic human requirements. These are security, fundamental rights, and material well-being. The Center for International Security Policy, directed by my colleague Wolfgang Ischinger, has already taken up its work. Reflecting the spirit of the school, its themes cover the traditional nation-state security policy topics, as well as topics like civil conflict, Julian Wucherpfennig works on that, conflict in areas of limited statehood, or cybersecurity. Next year, we will create a Center for Fundamental Rights, focused on the place of human and fundamental rights in domestic, regional, and global governance. 
and I don't need to go into details why this is important. Vashak Chile, sitting there, will work on that. In 2020, we plan to add a center for sustainability, focusing on the economic and political dimensions of material well-being and sustainability governance. There are two other centers that directly focus on the two cross-cutting themes and governance challenges I introduced earlier on. There will be a center for digital governance, focusing on the usefulness of digitalization for governance purposes and the need for regulation of digital processes and data. And the cooperation with Partnerschaft Deutschland clearly falls into that area. Finally, and you will not be surprised to hear that, the Hertie School needs a center for European affairs. You may have noticed that I resisted the temptation to talk about the European Union in every single sentence of the first part of my speech. The European Union is the bridge between globalization and the nation state. No one can express this better than Jürgen Habermas, who said the following words at this very lectern uh, 50 months ago when he was here with Emmanuel Macron and Sigmar Gabriel. I quote him, governance are muddling through without developing any perspective for shaping the future. Well, this is Habermas. Governance are muddling through, governments are muddling through without developing any perspective for shaping the future, any perspective for shaping the future. We, this is Jürgen Habermas, we find the lack of political will numbing, especially in the face of those problems that could only be solved jointly at the European level. Now this is a pledge for the European Union and its uh, research related to it. So I'm happy to announce that we will bring the think tank Dr. Law Institute uh, Berlin, which I created in 2014, to the Hertie School and incorporate the numerous research projects um, uh, on Europe here, the new center, the new Jacques Delors Center for European Affairs at the Hertie School of Governance will have a research and a think tank arm and in a meaningful way combine those two worlds. I think this is the first center of that kind with a research and a think tank arm in the entire European Union. So having listed all these elements, I'm grateful to the Hertie Foundation for supporting the strategy that I've just outlined. The Hertie Foundation will increase its financial contributions to the school. In the past decade, the annual contribution varied between 5.5 and 6 million euros. We now have the commitment from the foundation to increase its annual funding to 10 million euros within three years. And this is per annum. Mr. Weiser, Mr. Knobloch, you've listened to the applause. This is a major testimony to the foundation's belief in the school and in our mission. We thank you for this. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, let me finally conclude. The biggest danger to a public policy school is to stagnate, then become boring and only train obedient experts. At the Hertie School, we are fortunate that our founders took the right decisions about 15 years ago when they put us on track. We are private, but extremely well and solidly financed. We are academically flexible, but deeply anchored in international research, and we're recognized as a university under German law. We're located in the most exciting city for public policy in the world. Berlin needs a globally visible public policy school. There is one in every major capital. The Hertie School is still young and comparatively small, but we should rise with the importance of our city. We have outstanding faculty, a top-notch administration, and if I listened well to the finance senator, we might soon even have another home, which, if our dreams come true, would be a landmark in this city. And last not least, we have fantastic students. Dear students, my last message goes to you. You have been chosen among more than 2,000 applicants. You are 268 new students from 50 different countries. You're here because you're smart and you want to work for the common good. We want you to learn from us, but also with us. We want you to learn from each other. 
Dear students, public policy schools have long focused on the two Ps, policies and politics. But today's governance challenges require more than politics and policies. We should add a third P. They require people, people like you, that understand today and shape tomorrow. Welcome to the Hertie School of Governance.